My name is James Hensman. I'm the leader of the probabilistic models team at Fraulo.io. Uh, I'm here today with Haitham uh, Buama and Enrique Munoz. We're going to tell you a little bit about the science that goes into Fraulo's decision-making platform. So at Fraulo, we're really excited to be able to deploy and develop our research through the platform, which is called Vuku. At the moment, the platform is being deployed in uh, two areas this year. We're deploying in finance and in logistics. And in the near future, we're hoping to deploy in a host of other areas that we think are going to be uh, supported by our research. This presentation is really about the science that goes into the platform and how it works. Prowler is about a decision-making decision company. What we'd like to output is smarter and better decisions. How does our research fit into that? Well, there are three elements. My team looks at probabilistic models. We forecast what's going to happen into the future. Hytham's team looks at reinforcement learning. He looks at the knock-on effects of taking decisions and what's going to happen as we, uh, as we roll out decisions into the future. And Enrique's team looks at the game theoretic aspects of decision making. If you have multiple players in some decision making environment, how does taking one action by one agent in the environment affect the state of other agents in the environment? So let me start off by telling you a little bit about probabilistic models for decision making in complex environments. So Prowler is positioning itself as a decision making company. And this is the sort of dirty secret, if you like, of decision theory. There was an amazing professor at Cambridge called David Mackay. He wrote a fantastic book in 2003 called Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Algorithms. Everybody should read this book. It's fantastic. And chapter 43 is called Decision Theory. And it starts, decision theory is trivial, oh, aside from some computational details. So David is being rather tongue in cheek here. The computational details are kind of why we're all here. The computational details are like, how do we do machine learning? How do we make predictions? And how do we make decisions? What he's really trying to say is, there's only one equation that you need to understand how decision theory works. My presentation is about this equation. And I'm going to explain to you how it works. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, how my research fits into Prowler.io through this equation. Here it is. It says, take the decision that maximizes the expected utility. Take the argmax under A, which is a set of possible actions, with some outcomes. Those are x. There's some function that tells me how much do I like some outcomes happening. And then I have to take the action that maximizes the utility, or the, how much I like those outcomes happening, under some forecast P of x given A. So my team's all about probabilistic modeling. So my team is really all about building this P of x given A. It's my job to work out what's going to happen next. If I take some action, what's going to happen? Sometimes L of x is nice and straightforward. We're deploying finance. And in finance, the L of x is how much do I like making money? More money is surely better. In other applications that we're trying to serve, like logistics, the utility function, or how much I like outcomes, might be how long does my client have to wait to receive his or her order? The other two guys that we're going to talk to in a little bit also fit into this equation really rather beautifully. One of the things that's missing from the equation here is time. What's going to happen next? If I have a sequence of actions that I'm going to take, as I take those actions, the world is going to change. Our possible outcomes are going to change, and maybe the available actions are going to change. That's what Hytham's going to talk to you about a little bit. I've rather glossed over the idea that I just take the best action. I just take argmax under A. What if the action space is absolutely huge? One of our running examples is, suppose you want to allocate taxis in a city to all the people that want taxi rides. Well, uh, if you have a large city like London, there are an awful lot of taxis and an awful lot of people wanting taxis. So the space of the decision is absolutely huge. We're never going to be able to deal with a decision space that's that large, with an A parameter that's that large, unless we break it down with an agent-based view. 
That's what Enrique is going to talk to you about. So how do we apply this equation in practice? How do we, every day, use the one equation of decision theory to work out what should I do? Well, this is my favorite and very silly British example. My action is I take an umbrella or I don't take an umbrella. I've got a forecast of some outcome. The outcome is it rains or it doesn't rain. And I uh, inadvertently spend an awful lot of money getting this forecast from the BBC or the Met Office or similar. And then there's some other function that tells me how much do I like all of the outcomes. So it's a sunny day and I don't take an umbrella, that's the best outcome. Or I take an umbrella and it didn't rain, I'm mildly inconvenienced by taking an umbrella. Or I take an umbrella and it rains, it's mildly annoying. Worst of all, of course, is I don't take an umbrella and it does rain. So this utility function, this liking function, is represented by the, uh, the, the buttons on the, on the right-hand side here. And the forecast comes from the Met Office. But this is a rather simple problem from our perspective. Sure, it's really hard to predict the, the, the weather tomorrow. Right? But the decision space is really small. There's only one bit that I've got to flip. I take an umbrella or I don't. If I want to make decisions in complicated spaces, then I'm going to have to predict over complicated outcomes. Most of the machine learning algorithms that we use at the moment are really good at predicting simple things, even if that prediction is hard. A great example is Apple's face unlock technology. It's a really difficult problem to work out, is this the right user or not? Hats off to those guys, super tech. But the decision space is still small. There's only one bit that those guys have to flip. If we want to start making decisions in complicated environments, we need probabilistic models. We need to be able to forecast the probability of complex events that are going to happen. Let me explain a little bit more. Most machine learning methods are just number mappers. You have a neural network, you have some inputs, you have some outputs, and in the middle, there are some parameters that you're going to tweak. You feed in an image, you get a label on the outside, you adjust the weights of your neural network. Machine learning is the process of adjusting the weights of that neural network so that the mapping matches up with the data. You can do that for the weather. Probabilistic methods or Bayesian statistical modeling is a bit different in that it tries to say what are all of the plausible explanations for what's happening in the system? What are all of the reasonable sets of weights or all of the reasonable mappings from X to Y that are explained by the data? This is a much harder thing to do, but it allows us to do much more complicated things. It allows us to build models of much more complicated events. For example, maybe I want to forecast the statistics of some event. I'm prospecting for oil. Maybe I'd like to forecast the distribution of the different hydrocarbons that are going to come up when I drill this particular spot. Or maybe I want to forecast the statistics of uh, a sports game. I'd like to be able to forecast how many passes is Sergio Aguero going to be able to make in this game. I'm never going to be able to forecast the exact number, but surely I can forecast the statistics. Or maybe I have some spatial point event. Maybe I want to forecast all of the places where people are going to want pizza in the city tomorrow. Probabilistic models are really important if we're trying to deal with complex output data. So what's Prowler's motivation? Why are we so interested in probabilistic models? Why are we so interested in complex decision-making spaces? Well, we're driven towards building decision-making for smart cities complex environments where lots of things are interacting together. Why do we want to do this? Well, we'd like to be able to optimize the provision of services. We have the ability to provide some service, be it taxis or food delivery or last mile delivery in a city, crime prevention maybe, and we'd like to be able to plan how we're going to do these, how pl plan how we're going to uh, allocate our resources. And of course, every time we make a decision in the city, things change. Every time we land an aeroplane, people come off the aeroplane and need to get on the train system or the, uh, or the taxi system or similar. So let me spend the last two minutes of my talk showing you two examples of the kind of probabilistic model that Prowler was building. 
I'm really proud of this bit of work. It's going to appear at ICML this year. This is about scaling up a model called a Cox process, named after Professor Sir David Cox. It's a model of points. The data set here is from Porto. It's a data set that describes every taxi journey in Porto over a month. And uh, what my model is forecasting is the rate that people are going to want taxis across the city. The output is a spatio-temporal map. You can see time rolling in the bottom left-hand corner. The output of my model is this heat map over the city that says, what is the rate of taxis at this point in space and time? And overlaid on top of this, I'm showing you what happened the week after my training data. What happened, uh, what, what, was the, what really happened to the data? So what I guess you should take home from here is we can't forecast every single event. We can't forecast every point that somebody wanted to taxi, every white spot on the map. But we can forecast where are the hotspots going to be and when are they going to occur. Here's another taxi-motivated example. If you want to make smart decisions, we're going to need to be able to work out when those resources are going to be locked up and when they're going to be available again. We allocate a taxi. We'd like to know when am I going to be able to allocate that taxi to a new passenger. So we're going to need to forecast when somebody takes a taxi ride, where are they going to go? So we have a machine learning system who takes as an input uh, time and space, some point at the beginning of a taxi journey, and the output is a place, the, out, the, the destination of the taxi journey. This doesn't really conform to most standard machine learning methods. I can't really think of this as a map, because there are multiple possibilities that could happen on the output. If I pick somebody up at the train station, the idea of modeling this as uh, some destination plus or minus some error doesn't make very much sense. I need some complicated multimodal distribution on the output of my machine learning method. So what you're looking at here is, as I change the input to the algorithm, I move the, uh, the white token around the screen, I'm showing you how the distribution of possible outputs, that's destinations of my taxi rides, changes across the city. We do this with a nonlinear latent variable model. That's the end of my time. Hopefully I've motivated why probabilistic models are so important for making complicated decisions. And uh, now Hyphen's gonna tell you a little bit about how we roll those decisions out over time. Thanks a lot. Cheers. All right, uh, thanks James. So a disclaimer before I start, I'm actually a bit ill. And uh, so if I end up saying that DeepMind's reinforcement learning is better than ours, please do understand that I would have most probably overdosed on cough medication. So um, who of you knows reinforcement learning? Cool, all right. So um, what I'm gonna describe is uh, how we at Prowler.io are trying to get reinforcement learning to solve industrial scale problems. Uh, so let's start with a motivation. So if you are to consider any of the following problems, such as self-driving cars, uh, finance, logistics, robotics, or even the gaming industry. Though these problems look different at a high level, they actually uh, have something in common. In all these problems, we have an agent that is trying to perform a sequence of decisions in uncertain environments in presence of other agents. So if you have the self-driving car, your self-driving car needs to understand how it should go around the environment can't be pre-programmed up front, so it's very uncertain. And it has to strategically interact with others inside that environment. Now, not incidentally, this is the story of Prowler, summarizing our three research teams. So agent performing sequence of decisions, that's reinforcement learning. That's the team I'm leading. Uncertain environments and uh, uh, forecasts and predictions, that's what James just described. And the other agents in the strategic interaction be between them needed for scalability, that's what Enrique will talk about in a second. So since you guys know reinforcement learning, I'm gonna uh, scroll over this fast. So in reinforcement learning, we have an agent talking to an environment. The agent takes an action, the environment responds by a transition and a reward. So to illustrate, I'm the agent, I'm trying to reach that goal. I'm at the state, I decide to move forward. So my state changes, and then I get a number telling me, oh, this was a good move or a bad move if I got closer to the door or not. 
as I interact with this environment over and over again for some length of a horizon, then I collect a data set in form of triplets, which represent the states, the actions, successor states, and rewards. So I'm here, I went there, I went there, and so forth. From this, my goal is to learn a policy, which is simply an action selection rule. And that is uh, a box where I can give it a state, it can tell me what action to take. So, in reinforcement learning, we learn by gathering experience, like we do trial and error, we gather experience over and over again, and then we try to fit this black box or this box of the policy such that we enforce the good stuff and unenforce the bad stuff. Please note that this idea is uh, uh, way beyond the self-driving car that I just described. If you have Mario playing the game, the same idea holds, or if I have a robot trying to cook me some meal in the kitchen, the same idea holds. So if I'm able to crack this problem, then there's a wide range of industrial applications that I can actually tackle. One of the most famous successes of reinforcement learning was probably DeepQ networks, which I'm sure some of you has heard of. DeepQ networks were the first time we were able to train a reinforcement learner end to end. So the state of the system was simply just the picture of the environment, and that was mapped through a very complex convolutional network like this to low-level actions that told the Mario guy, should I go left, should I go right, should I jump up or down? So this is a graph from DeepMind's Nature paper that shows that you can do higher than human-level performance in these types of Atari games. And such an idea has also been carried way beyond just Atari games into real-world robotics by people at Berkeley, uh, such as uh, Sergey Levine, who actually did end-to-end uh, -end learning with a robot. So again, the image of the environment was the input. This was mapped through a complex function to low-level torques, and it was applied in simulations on the PR2 robot that you see there trying to make some sort of coffee. Though successful, the current reinforcement learning technology requires tons of interactions with the environment before it learns something useful. So for this agent to learn something successful, it has to talk to that environment tens of millions of times, make tens of millions of mistakes, and then learn from these mistakes. Clearly, this is nowhere near being applied to any industry. What we want to try to do at Prowler is we want to have a data efficient and scalable reinforcement learning algorithm that is capable of solving industrial applications. To illustrate, consider the finance problem. If I'm doing finance, I can't have my agent talk to the market 10 million times, do 10 million mistakes before it learns something useful, right? So this technology that we currently have is actually really pretty useless. What we want to try to do is we want to try to scale that up such that we have agents that learn not from millions, but from tens of interactions with that environment. To better understand this, let's try to dig deeper into current practices of reinforcement learning and see where the problems really reside. So let me illustrate this with this maze that you see here. So let's have our agent depicted by this dot there, and it has to arrive to the goal up there. Now, the right path that that agent needs to take is the one that I drew in bold lines there. And the others are all opportunities that the agent can explore, right? It can just try different things here and there. Since reinforcement learning does learning by trial and error, it has to be extremely lucky in this problem for it to observe this bold line over and over again before reinforcing the good behavior, right? So this is not going to really scale. You as a human, however, when you look at this problem, you don't solve, you don't solve it the way I just described, right? You build a high-level plan in your mind, yes? You say, I need to exit this door, I need to enter that door, and so forth, in order to the, arrive to the goal, right? So what you have done is you have created a hierarchy, right? So you created a high level of thinking and a low level of thinking. So you split this holistic problem into smaller chunks of easier problems to solve. What we want to do is we want to enable reinforcement learning to do that. Please note that this idea goes way beyond just the maze that I described. If you consider this game called Montezuma's Revenge, where you have this dude, it has, to go, it has to jump up the rope, go over the skull, get the key, go back and open the door. This is kind of the hardest Atari game we have, and this is the result of deep Q networks from DeepMind running after 10 million interactions. You can clearly see they were, like, th this does not solve the problem. So what I described so far was one level of complexity, which I like to call the task level complexity. There is a second level of complexity, and that is the agent level complexity inside a reinforcement learning problem. 
What I have talked about was my dot here. It was just a simple dot, right? It can go back and forth. But let's imagine that this dot was actually a some sort of an Android, uh, droid, which would has like very complex mechanical structure for it to uh, coordinate before solving this problem. So in other words, even if I gave this droid the right path to follow, it's a still a hard problem. Because before making one correct step forward, this guy needs to coordinate all its mechanical joints, otherwise it'll fall. So what others are doing, they're taking these two levels of complexity, the task level complexity and the agent level complexity. They're mixing them together, passing them through a humongous network, and then they're feeding this back, because remember, we collect this data, right? So, so we collect this data. So we add these two levels of complexity, have a huge network, feed it back, and then hope that we can decouple these levels of complexity to learn something successful. This is clearly an efficient solution, where we just will end up growing our networks bigger and bigger, will end up collecting more and more data, and this, by no means, will ever scale to anything. So this end-to-end -end learning approach is a bit not the right thing to do. Let me say it in this way, right? What we try to do at Prowler is we try to divide, modularize, and collate. So we're dividing the task complexity from the agent complexity. We're talking about the task complexity and building a hierarchy of solutions. So we're splitting that hard task into a hierarchical solution. We're letting the agent complexity to be something separate, which we also learn through model-based learning. So we let our droid learn how it coordinates itself, and then we collect them back together in order to solve the overall complex problems. So rather than just mixing things together, what we are going to do is we're going to divide them, modularize the solutions, and then collect them back again in order to solve the big problem. Now this should perform much better than current techniques. And by now, you clearly don't believe me. So let's take this idea and apply it to Montezuma's Revenge. So this is what you saw before. That's our technique, build, building on the division, modularization, and collation. So you can clearly see that we got the key, and we get stuck for some reason. Then we open the door. So we get the key, jump over the skull, get the, uh, go back and open the door. This is 15 million interactions with the environment, using DQNs, that is using 900,000 interactions with the environment using our technique. So you can clearly see that that made things much more efficient than uh, um, current practices of reinforcement learning. One word on this, I get the question, DQN is not state of the art, you should compare to something else. Oh, we tried, oh, we tried. We were never able to regenerate any of the results that were published in literature. We, in fact, talked to the authors trying to get these, and we didn't get anything back. And that's why I'm showing DQNs here. So since we handled the task level complexity, now let's talk a little bit about the agent level complexity. What we're going to do for the agent level complexity is we're going to create a model-based reinforcement learning algorithm. We're going to use James's model that he just described before to let the agent learn about the effect it has on itself and the environment, we're gonna use reinforcement learning in order to update according to the goal of the task after the division, and then we're gonna repeat. So this happens over and over again. Now, this is the result of applying this problem to a very simple robotics environment. On the x-axis, you see episodes. On the y-axis, you see rewards. And you see a couple of graphs. The red and green graphs are TRPO and PPO. I'm sure people working in reinforcement learning know that that's state-of-the-art policy search techniques. The one with the orange graph, that is DeepMind, which did a very similar technique to ours, but used their neural net as their model learner, and not James's model. And Prowler is what you see there. So higher is better. We clearly can solve this task faster. But the question is that how much faster? Please recognize the log scale. So the x-axis is logarithmic scale. So the numbers read, the red line there is about 2,000. The blue line here is about 15. So we were able to scale reinforcement learning in these types of problems by three orders of magnitude. Definitely, we are on the right track. All this has been implemented in our platform, and now we're ready to apply it 
to real world applications. So that was me talking about our reinforcement learning technology in brief. If you have any questions, please uh, write me. And now I'll hand over to Enrique. Thanks, Hatem. So this part of the talk is going to be more about how many of these decision makers can make decisions in the same environment. And uh, for doing that, let's think about these kind of situations where we have a bunch of different decision makers, all of them tr trying to maximize their own individual objective, whatever that is, Minim minimize their, their uh, commuting time, for example. And to think about these problems, what we're going to be focusing on is on how these many decision makers are uh, put in the same environment and they need to share some resources. In this case, the street uh, network, for example. And from this view, we can see that there are many different decision makers. If one of them screw up, they can screw up a lot of things for the, the rest of, of, of the decision makers here, creating kind of like traffics, for example. That's the kind of thing that we're going to be thinking about. And more specifically, let's think about this example where we have taxi fleet, and we can control that taxi fleet. And in this scenario, the question is, OK, we can if we have the task of uh, wanting to control this taxi fleet, how do we do that with the, with the current technology, with the kind of reinforcement learning algorithms that Hytham just described? And well, when I start thinking about that kind of questions, I first need to ask a question on how these individual decision makers are making decisions in this environment, just as how reinforcement learning does. Uh, it's a pretty hard pro problem for the individual decision makers. And we, when we try to put more and more decision makers, that just makes things worse exponentially. So trying to solve this from a central machine, kind of like a, have a fleet level intelligence, that's something that, that, that can be pretty hard. And so instead, what we're trying to do with, in this field is to add intelligence to the edge. So that means to the individual taxis in this case, so that uh, they can make decisions of their own with the hope that when we put them all together, they do something sensible as a, as a fleet. Uh, this kind of approach would make things way more scalable and way more robust in the sense that if one of these decision makers break up, for example, for some weird reason, they have a, a flat tire or something, the system can continue performing, uh, whereas other approaches would need to recompute the whole thing, for example. That's the kind of thing, uh, questions that we're interested in, in, in finding out. And to think about those kind of things, we first need to go a step back and think about what these single individual decision makers need to be doing. And to think about that, let's think about this individual car. It's trying to get through from a point uh, on the left to a point on the right. It has two different choices to take one route that takes him uh, five minutes to reach destination and another one that takes him uh, six minutes. This car is trying to minimize its commute time. So there's only one uh, optimal action here, which is to take the upper route. Pretty simple. OK, so what happens when we have multiple of these decision makers doing the same kind of problem, trying to reach a destination as fast as possible? Well, they are what we call selfish individuals. They're trying to maximize their own individual objectives. So this is exactly what they're going to be doing which is exactly what we see out there in the street and uh, creating huge congestions. And these are maybe the biggest suspects in any given city trying to route their users around the city. And as we can see, they're kind of suggesting the same route, which is just an, ex an extension of what I already said. They're going to create congestions. Why is this? They're using a selfish routing algorithm. And why are they doing that? Well, because individuals, they want to reach destination as fast as possible. And what these guys are doing, they're just predicting, given the current conditions, how much time um, uh, these individuals are going to take to get there. They're not considering that if all of them route the people in the same way at the same time, you're going to create these congestions, which is why congestions actually happen. This is what is called a reactive system. We instead want to take a more proactive approach trying to anticipate what the other decision makers are going to be doing, trying to prevent this from happening. And if that happens for the rest, that's OK. It's not going to happen to us. Uh, so instead of thinking of, of uh, as a congestion as a problem, let's think about it as a game instead, which is kind of game theory and what, what, I'm, what I care about. 
So it's this kind of like the same example, just a richer example from one I already showed. Two different routes to, to reach a destination to the right uh, uh, location. It's just that we need to have intermediate points that we need to reach. Uh, there are, this is the infrastructure that they're gonna be using. Some infrastructure are big streets that are wide enough to take as many uh, users as, uh, as needed. The eight means that it takes eight minutes to go from one point to the other point. And N, instead, those are narrow streets that they, can, they get congested. So N means the number of users that are using that segment. So we have six cars there for this easy example. One possibility, and that's actually the solution, uh, which is pretty naive to understand why, is to break evenly and uh, three cars use the, the upper route and the other three cars use the, the lower route. That gets every passenger uh, a commute time of 11 minutes, which is the, the three minutes plus eight or eight minutes plus three. Uh, three being the number of users that are using that segment that get congested. Okay, pretty simple. So but what happens here, uh, city planners might think, okay, let's m make things better for society. How about if we add a new segment uh, connecting these intermediate points? Surely that's gonna help congestion, right? Uh, well, let's think about that for a second. Uh, and let's imagine that that new segment is actually a super fast lane that doesn't really get congested. It takes one minute to get from those, from between those intermediate uh, points. Uh, and let's think about the decision-making process of one of these individuals and specifically concentrate on that node over there. There are two options to, to reach that uh, node. One, to take the straight line, takes the, which takes a, an individual n number of, sec, uh, uh, of minutes, which depends on the number of users that are using that segment, plus one. And the other segment is gonna be uh, constant, eight minutes to, to reach that, that goal. Uh, because there are only six cars, this, this uh, straight segment is always less or equal to seven minutes, which is way be it's better than eight all the time. Uh, so there's one single optimal choice, independent of the number of users that are using that segment, which is take the straight route. Everybody's gonna be using that route then, because that's, again, selfish routing. And because everybody uses that segment, then uh, they reach destination in 30 minutes now. Uh, so let's go back step and see what just happened. We added a new route and it just made things worse, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, but that's actually what's happening in, uh, here in London. There's a lot of examples on, on, uh, on those things happening. We uh, in the company are doing these kind of things at city level uh, simulations with an unbounded number of rational decision makers. Sometimes we program them, sometimes we just uh, let things run uh, as, as selfish individuals doing decisions. Um, we did that at, at the city level scale. It's pretty messy to show results on a city, or, uh, on, on a real, uh, what's happening on a real city. So this is just a sketch of, uh, to try to explain what things happen when we run a simulation of that scale. So we have a bunch of people trying to go from a residential area to a business area. And there are some places where they can get stuck which are like uh, uh, bridges, for example. So because they're using a selfish routing algorithm, this is what's, what's gonna happen, which is pretty undesirable. And what we do in the company is we incentivize them. That could be a, a possibility when we can't really uh, go into their head and modify their objective function. And for example, uh, a possible incentive here would be add a toll. And because they're not only caring about minimizing their commute time, they, they also care about uh, not spending a lot of money while doing so, uh, then they might reconsider and we can reroute society in that way. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's what we're doing here. In, in, uh, in my group, we care about building intelligent agents that can coordinate between themselves to create kind of like a team level, uh, very coordinated, interaction between them. These things can scale, which is pretty important here to really act in the real world. Uh, but we also do so while there are other decision makers in the same uh, environment, which is way more realistic, I guess. 
Uh, we do so uh, by adding all of these bits and pieces into our platform, which is Vuku, which already uh, uh, James explained that he has all these three fields of uh, uh, research going on at the same time. And just a brief one minute understanding of how this platform works. We have a target system, which is not the, the, the company system. This is a platform thing. So uh, we have an API that interacts with the environment itself, kind of like a connection with the reality. And there are data flowing in and data flowing out. Uh, environment data comes in into the system. That's more or less how the, the data flows in. We have data flowing in from, for example, rewards that is important for reinforcement learning, and also uh, environment data that, that is important for uh, predicting uh, the, the dynamics of the environment. Uh, everything is fed together to create policies and learn policy, new policies, which is how agents are going to interact with the system, and, and to create models about the environment, the dynamics of the environment. Everything fed into an agent-based thing that mixes everything together, puts them into different agents so that they can coordinate and make better decisions that, could then, that, that, that can then execute in the real world. That's in a nutshell how the platform works. Uh, feel free to come uh, and speak to us. We're in, in, we have a stand downstairs. Thank you very much. <laughs>